Well, good morning. Good to see you here for our morning service. You're very welcome, especially if you're a visitor with us this morning. And as we prepare our hearts for worship, the psalmist says in Psalm 145, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. So let's stand and let's praise the Lord as we sing together our opening hymn, which is, Give to your God immortal praise, mercy and truth are all his ways, wonders of grace to God belong. Repeat his mercies in your song. I was speaking not that long ago, um, not here but somewhere else, and uh, I was speaking on the greatness of God. And someone said to me on the way out, it's great to hear a sermon on the greatness of God. And God is great, and let's praise him together. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Let us all pray. Father, we do thank you that you are the God who is great and most worthy of praise. The God whose greatness no one can fathom. And we exalt you today. We praise you. We extol your name. And Father, what we do today in Christ, we will do forever and ever and ever in your throne room. Because, Father, you're the God who lives forever and the God who gives eternal life. And we thank you, Lord, that that comes to us when uh, perhaps we're children or when we're young adults or later in life. But whenever it happens, Lord, when you break into our lives and you give us the gift of faith, Father, you make our hearts to be praising hearts, hearts full of gratitude, hearts that are full of wonder. And we thank you today, Lord, that we then can commend our salvation from one to another, from one generation to another, and we can continue to say, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. And Father, as we come today to this service, we know that the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. And we come today, Lord, confessing that though we may be sophisticated in many ways, we are simple so far as the things of your word and your spirit are concerned. For, Lord, you're the God who is deep and high. 
the God who is beyond our understanding and left to ourselves, we would know nothing, hardly anything at all, apart from the fact that there is a God and a God of power. But because we have your word, Lord, we have a, a certain uh, light in a dark world. And we thank you that here, Father, we are given understanding, we are given teaching, we are given education, and your word, Lord, gives life, and our souls live because we meet with you in your word. And so today we pray that you will forgive us, Lord, as we come before you. Forgive us our laziness that sometimes we just can't be bothered to read your word, and we've got a million and one other things that we think are more important to do. Forgive us, Lord, that we can be stubborn, thinking that we know it all, and we've read it before, and what new have we got to learn? Forgive us, Lord, our unbelief that uh, we are just hardened in our hearts, and we just don't want to know, we don't want to hear. And forgive us, Lord, our pride that we think we know it all, that we have nothing new to learn, that we're just so full of our own importance. And Father, we pray that we will be forgiven our pride today. Lord, may your word be that light that we need. May it be like Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration where his clothes and his face shone brighter than the sun. May we see no one but Jesus today. May we meet uh, with him through this word. And our God, we pray that as it challenges us, that we would meet with you and have understanding of our times. So hear us, Lord, as we turn to you and pray to you and lift our hearts to you and humble ourselves before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read together from the Old Testament, from the book of Joel. Turn with me to the book of Joel, towards the end of the Old Testament, if you can find the book of Hosea, sort of a, a bigger book just before the book of Joel. Joel, um, I've been looking at where we're going over the next few weeks, and uh, I'm here for three weeks in a row, which I'm really pleased about. Um, things have been a bit disrupted between one thing and another. And I was thinking I'd like to go through a book in the Bible and uh, take it not really chapter by chapter, but I'm going to cover the book um, over these next three weeks. It's a short prophecy, um, just three uh, chapters, and I'm going to take it not chapter by chapter because chapter one's theme moves into chapter two. But it also turns up in the New Testament, so it's just not an Old Testament book turns up in the New Testament as well, and it has much to say to us in our day and age in which we are living. And if coming to church isn't about hearing God's Word and, and saying to ourselves, well, what does God's Word say? And enjoying God's Word, then what is it about? So uh, the book of Joel is maybe a book we haven't read very much about uh, or read very much of, but I hope that over these next three weeks, we will enjoy it together and uh, we'll grasp something of, of and, and I think this is big. I really do think this is big. Um, and the themes that are so relevant um, to where we're at and also to encouraging us in the things of God. So let me read chapter 1, verses 1 to 15 of Joel. Joel chapter 1, verses 1 to 15, let us hear the word of God. The word of the Lord that came to Joel son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. 
it has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, all who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Amen. And uh, we thank God for the reading of his word. Well, girls and boys, good to see some of you in church here today. Not as many as there were at uh, Children's Day a few weeks ago, but you're here. So if you'd like to come down to the front, we'll uh, come and talk with you there. Morning, girls and boys. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Only Casey. Good morning, girls and boys. Good. Morning, Good. Okay. So, um, I'm going to think with you today just about about things that that in normal life you hold in your hand. Okay. During the day, when you're eating, what do you hold in your hand when you're eating, Casey? A fork, A fork or Isaac. A knife, Gabrielle, or a spoon. Okay, so when you're eating, you usually hold something like a, a fork or a knife or a spoon in your hand. Okay, what about when you're writing? What do you hold in your hand, Gabrielle? Pardon? A pencil or a pen? Okay. Um, what about, there's been a lot of tennis on TV the last couple of weeks. Have you seen any of the tennis? What do you hold in your hand if you're playing tennis? Um, Phoebe? Tennis racket and Tom, a ball, okay. So, um, yep, we're going well. And what about if you're reading? What do you hold in your hand whenever you're reading? Robbie, a book or your, what else do you hold if you're reading? An iPad maybe, if you're reading something on the iPad, something like that. You, you use your hands in order to, to hold those things. Um, holding things, what does God hold in his hand? Isaac. The world? Yep. Yeah. And we sometimes sing, do you know that children's hymn we sometimes sing, he's got the whole world in his hands? He's got the whole world in his hands. Do you know that one? You do, you do, you do. Okay. Uh, Jonah knows it. Okay. So he's got the whole world in his hands and we sometimes, we sometimes sing that children's hymn. But God also has in his hands, got with me here this morning, Two, well, I thought there were two men. One's actually a man and one's a woman. Look closer. What are they? Pardon? Lego, Lego men. Okay. That one's actually a woman because I think that's lipstick on. Is it? Yeah, that's lipstick. And this one's a man. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a man, a Lego man, and a Lego woman. And the Bible talks about in Psalm 139 that the hand of God holds us fast, that God lays his hand upon us and holds us fast. And I wonder if you, that's, that's for the person who has given their life to the Lord. His hand is upon them 
and he holds them fast. And I was thinking about that. You know, these, these men are quite small in comparison to you and me. They're, they're tiny, aren't they? They're very small. And, and yet, I can hold them in my hand like that. And they can move forward. They can move back. They can go left. They can go right. But all the time, wherever they go, they're in my hand. See that? Wherever they go, put them there, put them backwards, up there. They're still in my hand. Wherever they are, they're in my hand. I'm holding them. And there's a sense in which when a person is a Christian and, and believes in Jesus and follows, wherever they go, they're always in the hand of God. God's hand is always underneath them, over them, with them, keeping them, protecting them, no matter where you go. And I think that's lovely. In fact, I think that's really beautiful that the hand of the Lord holds me keeps me and no matter where I am or no matter where I go I'm safe there might be things come against me there might be my trip and fall but nothing can can take me out of his hand and Jesus said that as well he said that no one can snatch can snatch someone who's a Christian no one can snatch them out of his hand now who wants to come and try and snatch the man I knew you would kiss him <laughs> Come on, try and snatch. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> you okay. Anybody else want to go? Jonah? want to go okay Robbie you're not doing it Tom no what's wrong what's wrong what's wrong can you not do it no anybody else anybody else no everybody yeah I mean Gabrielle do you want to go well, she's gonna go for the thumb no. Okay. So, I mean, it makes the point, doesn't it? I'm bigger than you, and I'm stronger than you, and I can hold on to the men in my hand, the man and the woman in my hand, and you can't get them. And Jesus said that no one can snatch them out of my hand. Whoever are his followers, his disciples, those who love him, those who, who, who make him king of their lives, Jesus says, you can't, no one can snatch, snatch you out of my hand. You're kept. You're safe. I think that's, that's brilliant. And, and you know, that is something that, that we should be really uh, pleased about and something that we should be saying to the Lord, Lord, I just thank you. We can fall and we can make mistakes, of course, and we can, sometimes the devil will come and the devil will trip us up. But when the Lord holds you in his hand, he holds you forever. And that's just something to be so thankful for. So we're going to sing the children's hymn, the children's chorus. We're going to stand and sing, Better is one day with Jesus than a thousand on my own. I don't want to be on my own in the world. I want to be with Jesus. And I want Jesus to be with me. Because if that's, if that's the case, if he is holding on to me, then that's better than anything else that this world has to offer. So let's stand and sing.
Well, once again, welcome to our service today and those also who uh, may be watching online. It's good to uh, see you as we uh, gather for our morning service. Just a few announcements today. There's mostly the announcements are on the announcement sheet. If you haven't got one of those, they, they should be available at the, the, the uh, desk on the way out. Um, but the drive-in tonight is at 7 o'clock over in the, the car park on the other side of the road. But a good number last week for our first drive-in of the summer. About 60 cars um, were there. And it was good to see quite a few people in some of those cars. And if you're able to come tonight, then you'll be very welcome at 7 o'clock. And if you can encourage others to come too, that would be really good. Um, for the week ahead, just to mention, the, uh, there's no midweek on, on Wednesday. The Port Stewart Convention is on this week. Um, what used to be called the Port Stewart Convention is now Keswick at Port Stewart Convention. Um, but um, there's, there's little postcards on, again on the table on the way out, and they give you details. So we encourage people on Wednesday to go to, the, go to Port Stewart for that um, and just to be part of that wider uh, gathering of Christian folk who listen to uh, God's word being taught. And next Sunday, I hope to be speaking at the morning service. And then lastly, um, as announced a few weeks ago, we hope to hold cleaning sessions to get our new halls ready for moving all the equipment into them from the old halls um, prior to the demolition of the old halls, probably in August. Um, the first of these cleaning sessions is this coming Thursday from 7 to 9. And the rest of the cleaning sessions are the following week. There are sign-up sheets um, on the survey in the meet and greet area. Uh, and there's still lots of places. It's good to see so many people have signed up, but there are still lots of spaces. And if you want to sign up for a, for a time uh, or times, um, then you'll be very, uh, you'll be very welcome um, on whatever time you sign up for. Um, if you're coming, you're asked to bring cleaning cloths, window cloths, buckets, and if possible, hoovers. Um, men are needed as well as women, um, and young people will be welcome as well. But we just want to get all the dust out and, and get everything spick and span, especially for the opening of the new halls coming up in September time. So those are, are all the announcements. Um, Let's pray together as we just again turn to God. Father, we thank you that we can approach your throne of grace with confidence and uh, we can find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. And so we do turn to you today in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for where we're at with the uh, uh, building of the new halls and that we are close to opening of the new halls, but we know there's work to be done in the meantime. And Father, we pray that you will, um, even as these cleaning uh, teams come together, even just use those, Lord, for, for times of getting to know each other and, and times of, even of fellowship and a sharing of, of life together. And we ask, Lord, that as we prepare for our opening and our, our new season, that you will continue, Lord, to, to be with us. And uh, we pray, too, for the financing of the remainder of that project, looking to you, Lord, aware that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. We also, Lord, pray today for our country. And uh, we remember, Lord, the government, as, as we know with the, the resignation of the prime minister, um, there is now turbulence and upheaval. Um, at, at the very highest levels of government. And we know for Northern Ireland too, we have no government. And uh, we come to pray for Westminster and Stormont. And we pray, Father, for the emergence of, of leaders, um, of integrity, of justice, of righteousness, for those who will do justly, who will love kindness and walk humbly with you as their God. Father, we commit to you the political leadership of our country, and we pray, Father, that you will remember those, Lord, elected to office, and we pray that you will use them for your glory. We pray for our young people today, Lord. We, we remember Hannah Smith in Slovakia. We pray for CEF Bible Clubs in 
Blanchardstown in Port Arlington in Drumray in, in August. And for those, Lord, who engage with children at the various camps, think of SISM this week at Port Stewart as well. And we pray that those who are leaders will be winsome, will be patient, will be filled with your spirit and concerned above all else to please you and to serve you. We thank you, Lord, that the work of your kingdom is, is many faceted. And we pray that wherever, Lord, the word of your kingdom goes forth, that, Lord, it may go forth with your spirit and with conviction and a sense, Father, of it being true in an age of so much that is fake and so much that is propaganda and lies. And Lord, we also pray today for those who are on holiday or are going on holiday at this holiday season. We know many people are weary at work and weary after COVID and weary with life and the new challenges now being thrown up in these days. We pray for refreshment for those on holiday, for a reviving not just of bodies, but also of minds and souls. And we pray that you will draw near, that they would be encouraged and ready to return, Lord, and to serve you uh, in this place and in their workplaces, in their homes, and in their uh, environments. And lastly, Lord, we pray for those who are unwell. We think of those, Lord, in, in nursing homes, for those in hospital or preparing to go into hospital. And Father, we pray for them. And we look to you, Lord, for healing. We look to you, Lord, for uh, a sense of you having their lives in your hands. And whatever happens, nothing can snatch them out of your hands. Thank you for that. And we pray you'll hear us as we pray our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing before we return to God's word. It's the uh, two uh, songs being uh, running, running into each other. Thank you for the cross, Lord followed by what is our hope in life and death.
if you have your Bible open at Joel chapter 1, this is where we're turning this morning. Whenever I was a child, I remember my grandfather um, giving off that petrol had reached the dizzying heights of a pound a gallon. Imagine a pound a gallon, 20 shillings for a gallon of petrol. Quite what he would make nowadays of petrol heading towards nine pounds a gallon, I can only guess. But then there's the health crisis as well that has engulfed our nation, not just the economic crisis, but the health crisis that we have lived with over the past two years because of COVID. Where the borrowing to pay for it has been astronomical and probably is indicating that there's going to be an even bigger economic crisis in the not too f distant future that will engulf us all. So whether it's a health crisis or an economic crisis, I don't know about you, but you have to start asking yourself the question, what is going on? Why are these storms enveloping our nation and our world? How can we make sense of this? How can we explain what is going on? Because it seems we are all caught up in these times that are very difficult to navigate. And that's why when we turn to the book of Joel, these short three chapters found amongst the minor prophets as they are called towards the end of the Old Testament, we find amazing comfort. Because Joel also lived in a day of a, of a crisis that engulfed the land of Israel. No one's really sure who he was or when exactly he lived or what the circumstances were, were, but he was a prophet. He was a man sent from God who had understanding of the times. He was filled with the Spirit of God. And as God steered events, he spoke through Joel to the people to get their attention and that they would hear the word of the Lord. And you know, as I've been reading these uh, prophets towards the end of the Old Testament, what I've been feeling increasingly is that these prophets and their message is what we need for our day and age as well. Because we are living in confusing times, mixed up times, and many are looking for clarity and for authority and for certainty. And here in this prophet, as we're centering and focusing upon him, we have won and we say, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. So let's think about the particular crisis that enveloped the land in the time of Joel. And from chapter one, we learn that it was a locust invasion, a plague of locusts descended upon the land. And from verse two of chapter one, we learn this was a plague unlike any other plague that had ever happened in their days or in the days of their forefathers. Hebrew uh, language has four different words for locusts, and all four of them are found here in Joel chapter 1. There's palmer worm, there's locust, there's canker worm, there's young locusts, there's other locusts. They pile up the words in the way the locusts would have been piled up in the land. It's not a very nice thought. For you and for me, we've probably hardly ever seen a locust, never mind a plague of locusts. But when the locusts fly in in their swarms, they really do fly in in swarms. They eat everything that's green, which for a farming economy was disastrous. Then they lay their eggs, and apparently when locusts lay eggs, in a square meter, there are 50 to 75,000 eggs in a square meter. Then when the eggs hatch, the young start to eat what's green and fertile in the land. Whatever the adults had left behind, whatever started to grow again, the young eat it. And it brings about economic catastrophe. Verse 16 talks about food being cut off. And it must have been awful to have to have had these numbers of locusts landing in the land, ugly insects 
crawling everywhere. You walked across the ground and you were crunching them under your feet. Pile them up and burn them. And you've no sooner burned the latest pile and there's more landing. And for the people here, they, uh, as I say, there was no one word to capture it all. They had to use all their words for locusts that they had. The things were everywhere. Ruining life, ruining their farms, ruining their, their hopes for the future. This was a disaster, this invasion of locusts. And this is where Joel, the man of God, comes in. Because Joel, inspired by the word of God, people would have been asking, what's going on? Why is this happening? Joel comes with God's word, and Joel speaks God's word. And what he says, first of all, is this, that you people need to learn how powerless you are. You need to learn how powerless you are. That there's absolutely nothing you can do in order to change these circumstances. And what Joel does here in chapter 1 is that he addresses different groupings of people. And he calls upon the different groupings of people in different ways to face up to what was happening and to learn the lesson that in and of yourselves you're powerless. You can't save yourself. He addresses the elders in verse 2. The elders were the, the older, mature men, those who had, who had gray hair, who had lots of experience and lots of common sense and, and lots of respectability. The elders were the rulers of the, of the land. But this locust plague was a plague that they had never seen anything like it before. And they were powerless to save anybody from the locusts. Then he swings to the other end of the spectrum, from the elders to the drunkards. And he has a word for them in verse 5. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep, he says. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Here were the people in society whose, problem, whose solution to the problems of life was to hit the bottle, to, drain their, to, to drown their sorrows in, as UB40 used to sing, red, red wine. But what if the locusts eat the grapes and eat the vines and the leaves and leave you with no fruit to make wine from? Won't the drinkers discover then what it's like to be powerless? Won't they wail that alcohol has let them down? Won't they mourn like a young bride mourning for the sudden loss of her young husband, as verse 8 puts it? And then the prophet moves from the elders and the drunkards to the farmers. In verse 11, he says, Despair, you farmers, wail, you, ground, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed, the vine is dried up, the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate, palm, and apple tree are dried up too. It's not just the vineyards that are gone, it's all fruit trees and so on that are gone. No harvest meant no food. It meant no profit. Can't make money if you have nothing to sell. And then there was no seed for next year. The farmers were left with no livelihood and they were the mainstay of the country. No wonder, he says, despair, you farmers. And there's those farmers in those days, the pesticides, well, they wouldn't have had the pesticides. They had to stand with their hands in their pockets just watching these locusts piling in and eating everything before their eyes. And the last group he addresses directly are the priests in verse 13. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. How can you bring drink offerings when there's no wine to offer, or grain offerings when there's no grain to offer. So the priests were standing around with their hands in their pockets. They had nothing to do either. But you hear how the different 
layers and different levels of society were being affected from the upper echelons, the elders. They were losing their status. The lower echelons, the drunkards, they were losing their pleasures. The working people, the farmers, they were losing their livelihoods. And the priests who were not able to make sacrifices, they were losing their power. And what each group in society and everyone else with them were learning is that there are things in this world about which you are powerless over. You can do nothing about. They're outside of your control. And you know, it's not often for people the first thing they need to learn in order to be saved that they can't save themselves. That's the first thing that people need to learn. You grow up thinking you're the bee's knees, you're in charge of your world. And you have your ambitions, you have your dreams, you have your plans, you have your future, and then something hits your life and you learn there is nothing absolutely nothing you can do about it. Maybe a life-changing car crash. Maybe an addiction creeping up in your life. Maybe a relationship that breaks down and with all your heart you don't want that relationship to break down, but it's breaking down. Or maybe an illness that comes upon you and it's, it's just out of your control. Or maybe a death in your family and you've done everything in your power to keep that person alive and still have died. And God uses these things to say to us, you think you're in control, you're not in control. You think you're powerful, you're not powerful at all. We learn that we are powerless in different ways, but God would, but God would have us learn it if we would be saved. And he pulls the rug out from under our feet because our human tendency is to try and to save ourselves. But secondly, in order to be saved, we must not only learn that we are powerless, but that God is all-powerful. Because who was behind the locusts? Who sent the locusts? Who ordered them to the land at that time? And we're told in verse 15, Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. And here is one of those challenging verses in the Bible to make you really think, to make you really uncomfortable, to unsettle you, so that you would keep yourself from idols and not make an idol out of God. God is God, and God does things that you and I can simply only bow before, and this is one of them. Because the controversial part that is coming out of Joel chapter 1, verse 15, is that God just doesn't permit disasters. God sends disasters. Let me say it again. God just doesn't permit disasters. God sends disasters. Amos says the same thing in chapter 3 and verse 6 of his prophecy. When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? And the Westminster Confession of Faith says in chapter 3, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. God is sovereign. And if I didn't believe that, well, life would just be a mess. But let me be careful to say that yes, God sends disaster, but he doesn't send sin, or he doesn't do evil, or he doesn't send the devil to do his work. There, there are things that he permits. But whatsoever comes to pass, God ordains for a purpose. And a disaster like a locust plague is an early warning system. 
sent by God to warn about something that's coming in the future. If you've been watching the news um, lately, you'll have perhaps seen photographs and, and footage of the war in Ukraine. And when the Russian missiles start flying, the Ukrainian cities sound air raid warnings, very eerie sound, an air raid siren. And the wail of the air raid siren as it, as it goes out over the city is a warning to the people to get into bomb shelters because there are missiles coming your way. You need to get ready. Will wars and famines and earthquakes and economic crashes and locust plagues are God's air raid sirens? that a big day of disaster is coming. Disasters like locust plagues and, and earthquakes, these are, these are small fry in comparison to the day of the Lord that is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand, says chapter two and verse one. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Judgment day, in other words, is coming. And disasters on earth now are, if you like, preparing us for the judgment day that is to come. And I believe, and I hear people saying this, and I, I agree with them 100%, I believe there is an increasing sense in society that judgment day can't be far away. The judgment day can't be far away. And God is using covid and God is using economic crisis to speak to us. I mean, when we're afraid to define what a woman is, is that not a sign of a society that needs judged? Somebody said, if God doesn't judge us, he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't know what a woman is, apparently. Is that not a sign we need to be judged? Or we say that you, you can change gender, you can change sex, even though science says you're born either male or female. When God created us, he created us male and female. But we say, oh, you know, we want to do it our way. We know better. Is that not an invitation? The rage against God that's, make no mistake, the culture wars that are being fought in our day are a rage against God. And the redefinition of marriage, when God ordained marriage, it was male and female, he created them. It was Adam and Eve. A picture of Christ, the bridegroom, and the church as the bride. Marriage was meant to be a picture of the, the union of the, the Lord of glory with his church, with his people, male and female. But we are telling God in our society, and remember David Cameron brought it into Britain and he gloried in the fact that he had brought in same-sex marriage when he resigned as prime minister. He didn't get the point. When you stand against God, there's only one winner. And we are telling God when we redefine marriage, God, your Bible is wrong. It can be two brides. It can be two bridegrooms. And when we say to God, your Bible is wrong, are we not saying, God, judge us? Judge us, because we're judging you. Amazing. The day and age in which we are living, the rage against God. And the prophet Joel was simply saying to the people in his day, what you need to learn is that God is all. He's locust, you can do nothing about it. 
and the economic crisis that is, that is enfolding our country, we can do nothing about it. COVID, we could do nothing about it. And God is speaking. That he is all powerful. And we are not. And my third and final point this morning is this. What, what's our response to all this? Our response, and Joel makes it very clear, we must repent. Which is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, the story of the tower. There was a tower that fell and killed 18 people. And there was also at that time worshippers, soldiers broke into the temple and massacred worshippers and mingled their blood with the animal's blood. Jesus didn't speculate on why these things happened. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, our problem is we are forgetting how sinful we are. We get comfortable in the world. We get drowsy in the world, drowsy in church. We drift, we drop our antennae, we tune in the sky, we tune in the Spotify, we tune into Netflix, we tune into the latest gossip over the garden fence. And then, what? God moves into our lives and calls us back. And this call to repentance, it goes out. Verse 12 of chapter 2, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. Return, return, return. If you think of soldiers on a parade ground when they're at attention, the command is given about turn and they pivot on their heels and they turn around. Montgomery Boyce says, an American Presbyterian in his commentary, he says, behind you is the Lord Jesus Christ, despised and rejected by you. If you hear God's command to repent, then turn, turn around to Christ and be drawn by the sweet wooing of the riches of his grace that will change the direction of your life forever. Because that's repentance. Repentance is me going my way. But then when I hear the voice of God behind me saying, this is the way, walk in it, I turn around and I learn that the Lord is the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And suddenly I discover what is true light, what is true hope, what is true confidence in the Lord and in the Lord alone. You see, that's what God was about in the book of Joel. And next week, we're going to go into uh, chapter 2, mostly, and we're going to see how it turns up in the Acts of the Apostles. So come back next week to hear the next installment. Because God is getting people ready for judgment day. But if you're not ready today, don't just sit there. Confess your sins to God. Turn to him. What's wrong with the world, we say? There's, so, there's something badly wrong with the world. Do you know what's wrong with the world? You are, and I am. And only as we get right with God can things begin to be made right again. And as I finish, one of the probably best known verses in the book of Joel is in chapter 2 and verse 25 where God says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm, there's the words piling up again. But notice how God says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. When the locusts eat your vines, it's years before they come back again. But God says, I'll repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. I'll repay you. I was speaking to someone yesterday at the wedding we had here, and I was speaking to them at the reception, and they were telling me a lovely story how their grandfather had been a Christian earlier in life, in their youth, but fell away from the Lord. 
for years. But then as an adult, uh, much, much later on, came back to the Lord in a very remarkable way. And then as an adult in that family, became very influential in influencing his grandchildren. And she was one of them. Yes, there were years in that man's life that had been wasted, but God restored the years. God is able to do that. He's all powerful. You might say to me today, Richard, I have wasted years in my life. We'll return to the return to the Lord. And He will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. You might say, Richard, I'm very far away from the Lord today. I haven't been close to the Lord in years. We'll turn to the Lord, confess it to him, tell him about it. And he will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Because that's the promise of his word. I will repay you for the years. I will do it. But you must turn. You must turn. And you'll discover the blessing of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for how in a day of disaster you were delighting to bring good things out of it. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for what uh, ways you work, mysterious ways. You, you do wonderful things, Lord, that we, we can know little or nothing about, and yet somehow you bring good out of evil. You bring light out of darkness. You bring hope out of despair. You bring usefulness out of waste. Father, we thank you for that, and we, we thank you for the power of this, this prophetic word. And we ask today, Lord, that you will continue to speak into our hearts, and may this word live, Lord, in whatever way we need it to live today. Hear us, Lord, as we pray these things and ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's finish by singing, search me, O God, and know my heart today. No.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion this day and forevermore. Amen.